For darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift your eyes and look around. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far away like Salt Lake City and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Yes, Iris. They shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover over you just what you were hoping for. <laughs> and the young camels of Midian and Epha, all those from Sheba shall come and they shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. And then from the gospel, according to Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Oh, Rachel's, I mean, but Bonnie is supposed to start. You know that, right? No, it's just, <laughs> Rachel. Well, I'm just By the way, first of all, if you all don't know, our, our Presbytery leader, um, transitional exec, is here with us today. So welcome, Rachel. Um, I'm just kind of slowly picking up. Oh, I do, I do. I'm have prepared people with me. Where? I've done this before where I look in there. My wife would tell me I do it every day in the pantry, but. Um. So I'm kind of slow to pick up on the theme mm -hmm. for all of Advent, but I finally noticed the wise men are asking the same questions. Right. Where right. and here. Um, what struck me about those two readings, though, is I, I wanted them in reverse. Mm. I wanted the Isaiah passage to be what we do now, mm. is that we shine, um, and not that it was foretelling, I don't know. Right, right, right. No, yeah. no, I, I, I like that. I also like, 
So, and, and if you didn't hear fully, uh, Rachel was saying, I, I love the idea of the Isaiah text. I'd like it to be the response to Epiphany, right? So this is, believe it or not, this is Epiphany Sunday. The weird things that happen to us when Christmas Eve is on a Sunday is that Epiphany is January 6th. If you've taken your tree down already, you're wrong. Um, but, uh, so, but the Sunday that we observe Epiphany is the Sunday closest to it, but not after, because that's baptism of our Lord Sunday. So we're epiphanying, and, and Rachel's kind of saying, I wish that Isaiah was the response to Epiphany, right? That we live as bearers of the light, to kind of you put words uh, in Rachel's mouth a little bit. Yeah. What does it mean to be bearers of light? It's kind of interesting with the artwork because um, so we've used these icons from Kelly Lattimore throughout um, Advent of the Holy Family in very contemporary, a traditional roles. Um, in this case, probably an immigrant family um, trying to find safe refuge, very much in the way of Jesus and the Holy Family trying to find, they'll flee to Egypt to get away from Herod. Um, and, and because it's the Holy Family and iconography, they have these sort of halos of light, right? But what if all of us bore halos of light? Yeah, Mary. Oh, I, I, I'm not used to this. We're usually in a small room. <laughs> I've seen this action in the news for months, we've, we've all been seeing this in the news for months in ev ev almost every country, every continent in the world, that this, this story just keeps getting reenacted and reenacted and reenacted. Does it, is it ever going to end? Mm -hmm. That's, why doesn't it ever end? Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sigh. So the words that come to mind are hoopla and horror. And it's, it's kind of like something that, that happens inside of us all the time. It's like I experience the presence of God and then there's fear. And I want to share my experience of God, but then like what will people think of me? And this, this inner conflict goes back and forth. And I see it there too, hoopla mm -hmm. and horror right. or fear. So, and what's, you, you gave me a segue to my favorite part of the Matthew text. So Warren, if you'll pull up... Um, Probably slide two of the Matthew text. Uh, go to the next slide. Maybe I'm wrong. You know, I'm just going to jump around. Next slide. <laughs> go back to the first slide. <laughs> I know the text. It's just the order of it that's all up. Okay, here we go. Number, verse three. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and then this part, here's your sigh, here's your, and all Jerusalem with him, right? So um, first of all, the reminder is that when the king is scared, everyone ought to be scared, right? And on some level, there's a juxtaposition between king and God, the divine, and it, we might call it divine right monarch, right? And there's a sense to which we become those overwhelmed by the hopes and the fears of the power players. And then what do we do with that, right? What do we do with that? Again, are we going to let our light shine? Um, or do we dim our light to not draw attention to ourselves? So part of the uh, whole reason that Israel... Um, starts remembering stories of Daniel in the Babylonian exile while they are under the oppression of the Seleucid Empire um, and Antiochus Epiphanes IV is because they're trying to remember someone who continued to let his light shine and accept the consequences um, before we had the words for civil disobedience. Um, and so, yeah, can we, dare we, let our light shine when we're supposed to be afraid and pulling our necks in? Ruth. 
It'll be on in a moment. Is it on? Yeah, okay. he's just making sure I don't double speak. So I'm struck that this is like watching a movie, right? You, you're watching along, it's maybe a murder mystery and the bad guy just showed up. But we know that everything's gonna be okay because someone's mm. gonna tell them to go back the other way. But, and I live like that, I think, with that expectation. But the world isn't living like that right now. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So the difference in whole, whether you live with an ultimate sense of hope that all things will ultimately turn out, right? even if it doesn't go a way that you would want to, versus not having that hope. And then the events of every day are overwhelming despair, right? So the interplay of Isaiah, right, is on metaphors of light and dark. A living in darkness versus living in the light. Um, and a lot of times um, today, you know, we might talk about despair and hope, um, bleakness and, and uh, if not optimism, the sense that there are other realities if we're willing to look for them and live in them. So do we have in ourselves, we were reading this, oh, in the devotional, if you were reading the uh, apocalyptic advent devotional in the last week, there was this thing about hope is, is just, it's like a thing you, you either have or you don't. It's hard to put hope into somebody. Um, but we kind of need to stoke the flames of hope and help the hope grow enough until it's shedding light to help other people see by it as well. Bonnie is inspired somewhere in here. Yeah, following up on that, I think it's interesting in Isaiah that it says, uh, for darkness shall cover, it, it says shine your light, but after that it says, for darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. And I think many of us feel like that's kind of the times that we are living in, mm -hmm. and the people were not being asked to shine their light in a time that was already light and pretty. It was in a time of darkness, and I think right. it's really important for us to, to do that. There's a good Madeline Engel poem, yeah, and then Anne, I think, was um, uh, that talks about that the child isn't born when we're ready right? The child is born before we're ready, when it doesn't look like the time, a messianic age, to use that language. Oh, no, I think my family wanted you to get it. My family has no interest in speaking. <laughs> well, I was, I was struck by that picture of the family fleeing. Um, I don't know if you could bring it up again. Picture. Oh. <laughs> Um, they're hurrying, obviously. They'd probably rather not be in that situation. But, you know, when you've got, I think, Gabriel, or at least a message of God saying, you, you, get a, you gotta go now. <laughs> right. Um, I don't see fear there. No. I think he, when you've got that understanding of the, of the Isaiah promise, even in dark times when who wants to get up and move overnight with a child, you don't, but yet if you've got the promise of the light, you don't have the fear. And I think that is what puts at bay some of the, what was you saying, hoopla and horror? Yeah. The hoopla and <laughs> it horror, It kind of yeah. controls some of that, even though it's not fun, you're in transition. I wonder, is there scripture reference of their time in Egypt? Not, ex except that they spend two years there until the angel tells them it's time to come home. Um, uh, what there is is prophecy fulfilled out of Egypt, I shall call my son, right? So, you know, if we're putting our historical critical hats on, we'll say they flee to Egypt because it's going to fulfill a prophecy to have him come home from there. I can't imagine that they wouldn't have had a positive effect where they were. Right. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and it's also a kind of a reminder to us, for instance, we have such a Western a white Western male understanding of the church, we should remember that the Coptic church in Egypt is far older than the Catholic church, you know? And um, uh, so, so yes, there's, there's going to be a lot of non-scriptural comment about that time and the, the genesis of that, um, but not within our scripture. Other thoughts of what you're feeling when we ask? Yeah, oh, yeah, Dina, you did say, Dina. My bad. No 
Um, the thoughts that I've been having for a while now are that we want everything now. Mm. These are not things that happen in a short period of time. And as I get older, I know that many of the things I want to see, I may not see in my lifetime. Mm. But that does not keep me from living to make them happen, one person, one person at a time, mm -hmm. and ga gathering many other people to look at that same dream. So I was very struck last week that as we celebrated Christmas Eve that Bethlehem was a place where there had been bombing and, and just the destruction there. And I'm really struck this week as we talk about the wise men and the Holy Family that there's this tremendous amount of people who are coming from the South to the United States. Um, and I, I don't know how many people are, I don't remember when I was watching the news the other day, but there are thousands of them that are coming together to the southern border. And I'm just really struck by that today, that it's not even just three, it's, I don't know, it's thousands who are coming. Mm -hmm. and, and then someone made the comment about the hopes and fears. And I'm like, wait, that's a part of a hymn we know. Yeah, hopes um, and fears of that we sang, years. right? That, in a little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in the dark streets and all these places where we just don't know what we're going to do, shines the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. So even as we don't know, like, I don't know what you do with all these people who are coming. Um, I don't know what to do with all this bombing that's happening in our world. But God reminds us that... Christ is here right now with us. Um, and then we don't have to figure it out alone. Right? Um, just very struck by all of those pieces. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, oh, wait, someone over here? Yes, Nancy. Nice. So that, that uh, a little town of Bethlehem just brought up to a story I read this, this week, and I don't know how many people are aware that it was written during the Civil War, Peace on Earth, Goodwill to Men. Mm. One of the things that I've always been struck by with the biblical text is that, um, and you made me think of it, the resoluteness of having heard God's word is always a little more sure in retrospect, right? So um, there's lots of times that we find folks in need of guidance, right? Moses, burning bush, interesting in the land of Midianite where those camels are coming from. Um, uh, again, that's not, that's not a mistake um, in the text. Um, we have the, the people being guided by a pillar of fire through the wilderness at night and a cloud by day. You have the still small voice. Again and again, we have these things. And I think one of the things, the dilemmas that we find ourselves in is we aren't as sure they're God's voice in the moment, Right? Um, until we can look backwards and be like, oh yeah, that bush was burning. <laughs> oh yeah, that was a pillar of fire and not just, you know, a gas leak. Uh, you know, we, so we, we live in that front side, you know, and I remember having a conversation years ago with a church member who said, you know, I never, in people of deep faith, I never get a sense of sacrifice out of them, that they felt like they sacrificed something. I was like, no, because you're hearing them on the backside, right? On the front side, the sacrifices we might make are huge, 
right? The ability to get up and go like Abraham did, like the Holy Family does, and go to a new land means cutting all ties, leaving everything behind. And that's a lot to leave behind if you look in my garage. Um, you know, so, so it's, that, it's that what do we need on the front side to be inspired to let our light shine? Um, to use uh, size language, rather than be struck by the hoopla and the horror of it. And so we are reminded, not that a child is born for me, but that a child is born for us, and not that I have to walk the road, but that we walk the road together. And how are we there for each other um, on the road, um, how are we there for each other when the roads lead to us um, and the refugees are headed our way? Um, where is that sense to which we begin to understand that it's not about me or us, but it is about all y'all and all of us? Um, and to find hope in the numbers and partly to find hope in the people who have hope when you don't. I have a, a really, really good friend who went into ministry at about the same time she was um, divorced. And that's hard. That's hard um, for anyone. It's really hard for a female to, in the South, have pastoral authority in the wake of all that. And in her own frustration um, with God and with whatever, everything that happens, the where is God in this? And she said, I couldn't really worship but I'd sit in the back pew and let the congregation worship for me. And I'll never forget her saying that because that's where the hopes and fears of all the years are born in us tonight. Amen. We come to a time of carol singing. That's, that's, not, that's not normal. Uh, okay. <laughs>